ओके थैंक यू वेरी मच बिस्मिल्लाम अलैक्म एंड वेलकम एवरीबडी टू दिस वेरी इम्पॉर्टेंट वेबिनार एंड द वर्ल्ड एक्चुअली इज फेसिंग एन आउट ब्रेक ऑफ कोविड नाइन्टीन एंड देर आर ट्रमेंडस एफर्ट्स टू फाइंड द एंटी वायरल मेडिसिन टू ट्रीट इट एंड द वैक्सीन टू प्रिवेंट हवेवर the results have not been fruitful up till now but the efforts are on and we are in the midst of a pandemic covid 19 when we look at the world we find that there are certain countries which have a higher prevalence or higher incidence of covid 19 as compared to some others and in pakistan we are now seeing an escalation of numbers and uh, it is the opportune time actually to be able to get prepared and uh, what best can it be for preparation than to get the first hand information from experts in their field who have been in the uh, front line of the management of covid-19 or who have discussed it with the different uh, experts who were engaged in it in different countries so i think uh, this is the and this is the way we can learn and move forward in pakistan hopefully from today's experience <clears throat> we will be able to make a plan as to what we should be doing in pakistan from what you teach us today for the purpose we have uh, experts the best in the uh, the best amongst the best professor peter safrovich from serbia professor uh, stefan achenberg from germany and uh, professor han from china and we have a very distinguished panel of experts uh, dr nanet from philippines dr ananda from ceylon dr harun from kenya Dr Parashar from India Dr Abid Amin who is the chairperson for the heart failure council of Pakistan and it is basically the heart failure council of Pakistan which is coordinating and cooperating with the world authorities so that we can try to learn ourselves and to disseminate this knowledge to all those who are listening to us and to all those who come in contact with us that is the main purpose of this webinar the first speaker that we have for today is uh, professor stefan achenberg and i would like to introduce him he is a very good friend of mine we have been together at the esc for several times i've heard him and he is one of the best speakers a very sought out speaker he is going to talk to us about the european experience and the esc guidance for cardiac patients the word guidance is different from what esc usually uses esc issues guidelines this is the first time that i have seen the word guidance being used that is that there is a continuous update that is good for our patients and what is not good for our patients professor stefan achenbach is the uh, president elect of the european society of cardiology chairman of the department of cardiology university of erlangen germany and now it is my distinct pleasure and honor to uh, welcome professor stefan achenbach to make his presentation professor achenbach Thank you very much um, Dr. Shabas it's a big pleasure to be here joined with so many experts from around the world I hope you can see my screen please let me know whether you can see the screen presentation Yeah we are seeing your screen now fantastic So it if there's any technical problem always let me know um okay. uh, so that I can be sure that you follow the presentation The um talk that I'm going to give is the experience that we have had in Europe and also what the european society of cardiology is doing to help spread information about covid and the related issues we all know um that 
the number of COVID-19 cases across the world is tremendous. The total count of registered, registered and confirmed cases as of yesterday evening is 4 million. And you can see how these cases spread across the world. These are on this map, the total number, but of course also very important information is the number of cases per million inhabitants, because obviously a large country can be more effective than a smaller country. But you can also see similar hotspots, so to speak, countries with a particularly high density of um, COVID-19 detected infections. And you can see that Europe is one of these areas that has a particularly high number of cases per capita and uh, the European countries. What are the reasons, potential reasons, why Europe is more significantly affected? Well, first of all, we have a very dense population. We also have an active population. Even the elderly travel a lot. They meet a lot. They participate in lots of social interaction. So there's a very easy way for a virus or any other infection to spread. And another reason why we have a high number of detected cases in Europe, of course, cannot be neglected. And that's the fact that very early on, the European countries started testing for the virus and therefore also detecting cases because obviously the more you test, the more cases you will detect. So the entire issue is rather multifactorial. Anyways, we have been unfortunately collecting lots of experience in Europe because of the high number of total cases and the high number of cases per capita. So it's our pleasure to share this experience with you. When did it start? In Europe, the first cases that were detected were end of January 2020. And in fact, here you can see the first 40 cases or so. The majority of them were in two clusters in Germany and France. And they could be traced uh, to um, uh, the virus being brought in from China. And because they were detected rather early, they could be rather rapidly contained the outbreaks. For example, one of them was in southern Germany in uh, related to a factory of a company that also entertains a factory in China. So just to tell you that the first cases that we have had detected were at end of January. Now we are pretty certain that probably there have been cases in Europe earlier than that, um, even as early as November and December 2019, <clears throat> but they were simply not detected. Because um, of the uh, warning we had, um, because China had been dealing with this uh, disease so well through uh, containment measures and, um, and Germany and France, which had these first two clusters of infection also acted rather rapidly. Initially, these infections could be contained rather well and there was a long period of quiet until suddenly in March, we received news from Italy about a tremendously rapid rise in the number of infections. I remember very vividly March 5, when we still thought that everything in Europe is pretty much contained. We received an email at the European Society of Cardiology from an Italian colleague, just an informal email written in haste because he had so much work saying, suddenly there are 160 patients with COVID-19 in our hospital. Overnight, 17 patients were admitted last night, just one over one night, four have died after admission, all of the intensive care units are full. We are creating a new 30 patient COVID unit every other day in our hospital. So this was a massive warning because of the sudden surge of numbers in Northern Italy that were sent throughout the cardiology and medical community throughout Europe. And really it was marked the start of the rapidly rising number of cases in Europe. Here you can see the development of cases in Europe. First, First cases detected in January, for a long time, nothing happened. And then we had a phase of exponential growth. Here you can see March 5, this is the date that I marked when we got the information about the high number of cases in Italy that were really uh, overwhelming the emergency rooms and the intensive care units. A period of exponential growth initially. And then since then we have had a period of linear growth, which is now somewhat slowing in Europe. These are the European detected cumulative cases. And of course, you've all heard that um, after the lessons taught by China and the lessons 
with other infectious diseases in some other parts of Southeast Asia in the past several years, um, the European countries, one after another, introduced measures of social distancing. They were sometimes called lockdown. They were not equally strict across European countries. In Germany, for example, there were two steps. First, public gatherings were forbidden. And then, and then after a while, the shops closed, the schools closed, and people were not allowed to leave the house unless they had to go to work or to shop. In other countries, the measures were much more strict. In France, for example, you could only leave the house for one hour a day if you had a specific permit to leave the house. So the, the, uh, the stringency and the strictness of the measures varied from country to country, but more or less around mid-March, the European countries introduced what is uh, referred to as lockdown, but let's call it social distancing measures. And you can see the effect this had on the new cases detected per day. These are the new infections detected per day. About two weeks later, two weeks after these lockdown measures, you can see the numbers go down. And now, after a few weeks and months of social distancing measures, most European countries are seeing relatively small numbers of new infections that happen per day. One this difference being the United Kingdom, which started the lockdown or the social distancing relatively late because they were initially relying on a different strategy, herd immunity. But um, they have so far not been able to bring down the numbers, but probably this will happen within the next few weeks or so. Now in Europe, we are in a very strong political discussion to release the social distancing measures. Germany has gone back to allow people to go shopping, has reopened the shops. The schools are partly reopened. This has been going on for a week now, but we are very worried about what this will mean um, for the healthcare systems and for the number of cases that will occur um, about two weeks after these social distancing measures have been released. So the lesson number one is that we all know there's a tremendous uh, number of cases across Europe, across the world, but it seems to be, and the data show, that early lockdown measures very effectively limit um, the spread for um, the corona-19 uh, cases. It's also interesting to see that there is substantial heterogeneity, geographic heterogeneity of detected cases, but also of hospitalizations and mortality. This is visible per country, where, for example, you can see now, these are data from yesterday, USA has more than 1.2 million cases, Spain has 250,000, Germany is here at 170,000, Brazil has 130,000, even though it's much larger than Germany, for example. So there is substantial geographic heterogeneity across the world and also within Europe. And the interesting phenomenon is, here you can see maps that once again indicate the number of cases per capita showing the heterogeneity. The interesting fact is that it's very, very granular. Even within countries, you have high geographic heterogeneity. This is a map of Italy as of uh, three days ago. And you can still see that there are hotspots with very high number of detected cases up here in Northern Italy, just a few counties. While in other parts of Italy, there's almost nothing going on. And this is something that you observe everywhere. Germany, exactly the same thing. I personally reside here in Southern Germany in Bavaria. You can see that overall Southern Germany is more seriously affected than the more Northern parts of Italy. I'll come back to the reason in a second. But you can also see that there's substantial geographic heterogeneity. There are hotspots and many of these hotspots, areas with particularly high numbers of infections have particular reasons. Um, in France, for example, we had uh, a big church celebration that was the reason in, for, in one region of France here right next to Germany. In Germany, you can see a hotspot here that was related to a big carnival celebration. This is where people come together and have lots of alcohol and are generally very happy and close to each other. Here in southern Bavaria, uh, close to where I live, we have a small area of three counties which had very high numbers of infections that were related to a beer festivity. And uh, they could be traced to this beer fest where people also come together relatively closely. In Southern Germany in general, you see higher numbers than in Northern Germany. And this is because 
people in southern Germany like to go to Austria for the weekend to ski. Um, and there's a lot of exchange of young and active people who go skiing and then bring brought back the virus, especially from the after ski partying that is going on in the Austrian ski resorts. So there are reasons for these geographic heterogeneities. In many cases also, if you look even smaller from city to city, you can see that areas of, with very high numbers of infections are related to nursing homes for the elderly and hospitals. Some hospitals, we have a hospital just about 30 kilometers from here with very high numbers where the isolation measures were not very effective. And this caused a spread of infection in this city by healthcare workers who brought the virus home. So we have a substantial, and that's important to note, substantial and finely granulated geographic heterogeneity of the severity of this disease and the, the pandemic in general. It is also interesting to see that the mortality numbers differ quite substantially from country to country. The number of mortality related to the detected cases in Spain, Italy, for example, 10 and 13%, in France, even 18%. In some countries such as Turkey, 2%, and in Germany, currently we have 3%. Death relative to the detected cases. But once again, there's a tremendous number of uh, confounders for this number, the mortality, um, it depends on the extent of testing. If you test the relatively healthy, if you test young individuals with very slight symptoms, you will find many cases, but few will die. That's for example, in Germany, where we do a lot of testing, very liberal testing, um, we detect many cases. Um, so this sort of dilutes the number of patients who die. So this is part of the reason why we have a relatively low mortality in Germany, because we find lots of only slightly um, 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 symptomatic patients. It's also of the age of the infected of the affected population, which is important. You can see that in Germany, the age of the affected population on average, the median is 49 years, while in Italy, it is 62 years, the median age of the infected patients. And this is a correlation to mortality because young, even though they are young, unfortunately, who pass away, of course, have much better chances of surviving. And in Germany, as I said, initially the disease was brought in by young people who were skiing. And this is why the average age of the German cases is relatively low compared to other countries such as Italy and France. And this is also one of the reasons why outbreaks in senior citizen communities, in nursing homes, in homes for the elderly are particularly dangerous because they go along with a very high mortality. So we have a multi-causal and substantial variation of death rates. And of course, if the healthcare system is overwhelmed, such as it was in some regions of Italy, in some regions of France, in some regions such as Madrid, in Spain, if the healthcare system is overwhelmed, which only happens on a very granular case to case basis in a very high degree of uh, geographic heterogeneity, then of course the case numbers, the mortality numbers also go up substantially. We've also noticed in Europe, and especially as the ESC, that there's, of course, with this new situation and the massive impact it has on healthcare, there's a substantial need for information, well, both from the healthcare community and also, obviously, from patients. That's why the European Society of Cardiology has started a resource, online resource, the COVID-19 pages of the European Society of Cardiology, which concentrates various forms of educational and informational resources um, on one spot that is easy to assess. Um, there are you know, video interviews with experts from across Europe that um, share important information on managing and uh, treating this disease. There's podcasts, there's reports, there's um, manuscripts from European Heart Journal papers. And there's also a very big document which was just recently published, it's called, as Dr. Shaba said, the ESE guidance for the diagnosis and management of cardiovascular disease during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's guidance and not guidelines because guidelines rely on randomized trial. And that's what we notice painfully that there's almost no randomized double blind high quality data on how to manage COVID-19. Much is speculation, much is case reports, much is small series of uncontrolled uh, data 
which makes, of course, it very, very difficult to generate recommendations. And this is why this is guidance and not guidelines. Also, as Professor Shabas pointed out, these are updated and uh, they are continuously modified. And this is why it's guidance and not guidelines. We can see that a lot of colleagues, colleagues are addressing these resources. We can see that we have received almost a quarter million views uh, since this page was seen, um, about 20,000 daily views um, on single days, and the um, access comes from all parts of the world, lots of it from Italy, so severely affected, but also the United States, for example, sends lots of questions to this website. So there's a substantial need for information. Sometimes you think that people are uh, willing to believe almost anything they hear in relation to COVID-19, and for expert-based information, you can go as one potential resource to scario.org slash COVID, which will take you to this um, page, this portal of tremendously valuable information. I would like to come back to this guidance document that we have published and just show you a few examples because it's very, very comprehensive. Depending on what you're looking for, it talks about the pathology, about the diagnosis. It also talks about treatment. It talks about how the drugs that are currently considered for treatment, such as chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, how they interact with the cardiovascular system and in which way you have to pay attention to interactions if you have cardiac patients taking medication. So all of this can be looked up with a lot of detail in this document. If you need any information, you can be relatively sure to find it in this document, which is on the page as cardio.org slash COVID. And there it is easy to access. The document also emphasizes that you should not gener uh, very generously deviate from the guidelines that we have for the management of cardiovascular diseases. The guidelines, for example, in this case, how to treat STEMI, that to prefer primary PCI over fibrinolysis if it can be done in a timely fashion, the guidelines are based on valid data and they should not be questioned or ignored during the COVID-19 pandemic. So there are some considerations, for example, if the transfer to primary PCI because of the COVID-19 epidemic takes longer than usual, you might consider fibrinolysis, but the general rules of preferring primary PCI over fibrinolysis, for example, as one example, they remain in the overwhelming opinion of experts and even those in Italy, which have been had, having to deal with a very overwhelmed healthcare system, the overwhelming experts is that you still serve the patients best if you follow the guidelines whenever possible and don't modify management because of the COVID-19 pandemic. If it can safely be done, if the guidelines can safely be followed, then they should be followed. The document also, and this is something that I personally consider very important, speaks about personal protective uh, equipment and how you should protect healthcare workers, depending on what the procedures are. What do you do for TTE? What do you do for TEE? What do you do during a cath procedure? And many other um, situations are listed here. It is important because healthcare systems can spread the disease. They can become hotspots if there are infections among the healthcare workers. And it, if you have to send healthcare workers into quarantine, because they have been exposed, then the entire healthcare system comes in big danger of being overwhelmed. And that is something that we desperately and very actively have to try and avoid, that healthcare workers are being infected and then cannot serve the population anymore for a period of two weeks when they have to be in quarantine. So getting the system ready and protecting the workers and avoid that healthcare workers have to go into quarantine is extremely important in order not to have the healthcare system overwhelmed when the number of cases increases. Just as an example of what we've been doing in our institution, we have been getting one of our labs particularly prepared um, for COVID-19 cases, which of course can show up any, day or any time of day or night. We have specific boxes with equipment, protective equipment for our staff in the cath lab. We have practiced um, intensively how to put on and take off this protective equipment. It's not elaborate, is relatively basic protective equipment, but still you have to teach the nurses and the techs how to take it on and how to remove, how to put it on and how to remove it safely. We have in fact increased the number of staff rather than decreased the number of staff on call. 
We have put an additional nurse on call for acute cases. We are we are incentivizing for them to stay in the hospital rather than go home and work from from an at-home basis so that we can react earlier. We have put in an additional nurse so that we can more easily follow the protective measures when a patient with COVID-19 or with suspected COVID-19 comes into the hospital. Rather than decreasing, we have, after careful consideration, put an additional nurse on call to transfer material in and out of the lab safely and to avoid contamination. Um, that's what we did because we consider it very important to keep our staff um, protected. The hospital in general also has a policy, and I do not know what the situation in other countries is, that there are absolutely no visitors um, to hospital patients. Um, there is a massive limitation of outpatient visits. And now that we have reduced patient numbers, we are starting to re-allow visitors. Every patient can have one visitor for one hour per day and no more than that. And we're slowly increasing our outpatient clinics again. All staff in the hospital is wearing protective masks. Um, they are not super effective to protect yourself from an infection, but they protect the others in case you are infected. And this is why everybody in the hospital is now wearing masks throughout the day. It's not only the COVID patients that we're worried about. And this is something that the ESE has put tremendous focus on. The other patients are also and are completely unchanged to the situation before the COVID pandemic are also very, very important. Cardiovascular mortality is still one of the top reasons for mortality. And we are very worried that patients will not seek attention, medical attention, if they have a cardiac condition because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Here's just one example. We have not seen, luckily, we have not seen many of such cases in our institution, but there are cases of this patient who has had chest pain for three weeks and did not want to go to the hospital because he said they probably need their beds for the COVID-19 patients. I better stay home. But then after three weeks, he just couldn't tolerate his chest pain anymore. And he came and of course the anterior wall infarct had been happening three weeks ago and has a massive aneurysm. And this will cause him problems during the rest of his life. And that's what we're worried about, the patients who do not seek attention soon enough because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Here is some data. Here is data from the United Kingdom about the number of emergency room visits for cardiac diseases per day. And you can see how the number drops by 50% from about 450 to 250 at the time that the COVID-19 pandemic started. And this is something that is very troublesome. Um, and this is something that we have, um, have identified as an area that absolutely needs our attention as the European Society of Cardiology, but also as the cardiovascular community worldwide. There are similar data from Austria. This has been published in the European Heart Journal. The number of patients admitted for acute coronary syndromes, you can see two weeks before the COVID-19 pandemic, about 230 per week, and then suddenly a drop to 150 per week and 140 per week <clears throat> after March 16, and the COVID-19 pandemic really took off. So this is something that is of substantial concern. Why is this? Nobody really knows why the numbers go down. There might be factors related to the healthcare system in general. Maybe a patient now reporting this shortness of breath is not as easily recognized as a cardiac patient because the healthcare providers first think of COVID-19. So the interpretation of symptoms might be <clears throat> done differently than it has been in the past. Theoretically, there can be issues of availability of ambulances and availability of transport to the hospital, but we don't think that's the case in Europe at the moment. There's certainly a case is a, a, a caused by the reduction of elective interventions. The complications have also become fewer. Um, these might be factors. But mainly, we think these are patient-related factors. Patients who don't go to the hospital, they misinterpret their symptoms because they think the symptoms are COVID-19 rather than cardiac. More importantly, they try to avoid going to the hospitals for the fear of um, becoming infected in the hospital. So it's important to make clear to the patients that they can come to the hospital safely. There's also the theory that maybe there are indeed fewer acute coronary syndromes because of the lockdown, because of the social distancing measures. Maybe there's less air pollution. Maybe patients are less active. And um, in this way, the heart rate goes down. And this triggers population-wide maybe 
a somewhat lower number of acute coronary syndromes, but this is really not known at the moment. In this context, there's an interesting observation that we have made in our department by looking at the at the monitors of patients who have implanted ICDs, and we do home monitoring of these patients. And um, these, these ICDs, they record the daily physical activity. The time spent physically active can be, is transmitted every day uh, into the home monitoring system. And I looked up a few patients and you can see quite a few patients where the level of physical activity, here you can see an entire year, the level of physical activity per week. And you can see that around mid-March, the level of physical activity in this patient drops substantially. Here's another patient where in mid-March, the level of physical activity dropped. Here's another patient where there's a certain fluctuation, of course, always, but around mid-March, the level of physical activity dropped. These are all heart failure patients with implanted ICDs in home monitoring, and these are some selected cases. This certainly needs to be done more systematically, but it's interesting to see that the social distancing measures, the lockdown affects patients on many, many levels, probably many more levels than we consider uh, superficially um, how this COVID-19 pandemic has an effect on cardiovascular patients. But that's just a side note. Our main worry is that patients do not use the healthcare system when they have coronary artery disease, when they have acute coronary syndromes. And the main reason probably for that is the fear of going to the hospitals, the fear of becoming infected in a hospital. And this is something that we very actively need to act against. So patient behavior during the COVID-19 pandemic is a major concern of the ESC and of the cardiovascular community in, in Europe. One, this is one of the reasons why the ESC has also published a patient document, a question and answer document for patients in relation to COVID-19. This is also found on the same website, scardio.org slash COVID. The document starts at the very beginning with a message that I've just told you that you should not ignore symptoms of heart attack or stroke. The neurologists are reporting to us the very same observation that the number of stroke patients admitted to the hospital has gone down to 50%. So as I said, don't, um, don't, the patients have to know that they should not ignore these symptoms and that even during the pandemic, they should not delay um, using the healthcare system and seeking for medical um, support. And that's the number one message that this document has. But the document for patients also talks about many other issues. And once again, as I said previously, with the professional documents and the guidelines and how you should not deviate from the guideline recommended treatment whenever possible, of course, there's the big question of cardiac patients, whether they should continue their medication during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the clear message from the ESC is that medication should not be stopped. Even there has been some discussion that the um, angiotensin receptor is important for the virus to enter the cell. This has led some to recommend that ACE inhibitors should be stopped and angiotensin receptor blockers should be stopped, but the clear guidance from the ESC is that's not the case if you are hypertensive patients and you're taking ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor antagonists, you should not stop this medication. Whether you have a worry of being infected or whether you are infected, this medication should not be stopped because there's absolutely no evidence that this will alter the course of disease, that it will help the virus enter your system if you take ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. So in summary, at the end of my presentation, um, I would like to say once again that there is a substantial heterogeneity in case numbers, both from country to country, but also within countries, within counties, from city to city, we see a massive heterogeneity. One city can be hardly affected at all, while in another city, the healthcare system is almost overwhelmed. Social distancing, from what we've seen in Europe, seems to be effective in limiting the spread if the measures are started early. Protection of healthcare workers, this is a personal message from me, is massively important because senior citizen homes and hospitals can serve as a focus of disease and spread the disease. And of course, if you have to put your healthcare workers into quarantine, it's very, very complex to keep the healthcare system running in your area. And finally, the substantial concern that we have regarding patient behavior, non-COVID patient behavior, during the COVID-19 pandemic, which can lead, if we don't pay attention, can lead to an increase in cardiovascular mortality and something that we definitely want to avoid and have to avoid. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, I would be very happy to try and answer them best I can. Thank you. Uh, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, sure.
Professor, Professor Peter, Peter uh, sorry, Professor, Professor Stefan Achenbach. And uh, if you will kindly stay on so that we can have the oh, question okay. answers at the end. And uh, <clears throat> now I will request Professor Peter Safrovich, Professor of Internal Medicine, Chair of Internal Medicine, and the President of the Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology. We have the pleasure of listening to him and his topic is impact on the failing heart and ESC heart failure association recommendations. Professor Peter Sefrovich, please. You need to go to the sh uh, share screen. No, I'm at share screen now, but and, now uh, I need to have uh, I need to have uh, desktop. My my presentation is, is is on the desktop. It's coming now. You can okay. now click on your presentation. No, no problem. No problem. Let me get to the desktop. Just one second, please. No problem. Let, let me get down with this and with uh, close this. And then here I am. Okay. Could you see me now? Yes, we can see your desktop. Uh, could you see the presentation? Not as yet. No. Okay. You need to click it twice. Okay, I will click what twice. Too many things. Okay. That happens. So now So do do you see now? Not as yet. Okay, because I have my presentation but I can see I can only see it but not you. Um, resume share, huh? or uh, new share. Okay, here it is. Is it better now? Much better. Uh, could you see me? Could you see my presentation? We can see your presentation. You need to be on the full screen. Okay, let me be on the full screen. Let me move this. Just you one can, second. I think here at the bottom. Okay. No, it's on, it's on the top because uh, I think you need to press five. F five. F five. F five. Okay, F five. I pressed F five. Nothing happens as usual. Uh, just one second. Can you can, you can bring the mouse down? Can you bring it down? Yes. Here, here. Okay. To, to the end. To the end here. Uh, more, huh? Is that more or? Here, here. There's a button. So let me try once again. So it's. Peter, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You're doing fine. You have a red line in the bottom. At the right, there's a plus and a minus sign. Uh, right. Is that on the Zoom? On, on your, the Zoom bar? You, no, your PowerPoint. Look at your PowerPoint. Oh, okay. At the bottom, there's a red bar. On the right, there's plus and minus. Exactly. Go left and hit the symbol that looks like a projection screen. No, no, no. Hit the symbol that next to the minus. Next to the minus. Oh, okay. Good, good. Sorry. Yes, sorry. sorry. There you go. Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Sometimes it's uh, easy. Sometimes it's not, but uh, uh, it's okay. So thank you once again very much for inviting me. As I told you in a discussion before our uh, uh, presentations, I felt really nice uh, because we already have uh, several discussions together. And uh, what I need uh, to address uh, now is uh, the complexity of the heart failure in the, in the patient with uh, COVID. Uh, uh, Stefan already showed the global burden of uh, coronavirus uh, all over the world, but as we can see, what is happening is the tremendous burden of the cases, but also extremely high mortality. This different mortality in a different country was ex was um, um, uh, expressing differently, but uh, could be explained uh, on the first place with uh, several important uh, comorbidities which the patient uh, with COVID is exposed to. Sometimes in the COVID era, we try to forget 
that uh, cardiovascular disease with its uh, high impact on the mortality and mor morbidity on the population is uh, still around. And although this is a kind of uh, acute setting in whom we are fighting with COVID, uh, cardiovascular disease is still uh, our major problem and the problem which is uh, here to stay. Uh, what are the differences and what are the synergies between the heart failure and COVID infection? If we look at the epidemiology, it can be clearly seen that these two diseases are closely associated. First of all, it, it can be seen that uh, up to 40% of the patient uh, who are infected with, with COVID has a previous heart failure. And even more that the patient who are critically ill may also suffer from uh, cardiovascular disease uh, in type of cardiomyopathy, which is basically heart failure. On the other hand, if you look at the pathophysiology of the COVID, we can see that myocardial damage is one of the major contributors to what is uh, going on in the, in the body of uh, COVID-19 disease person. On the other hand, we can see that uh, cardiovascular comorbidities and cerebrovascular comorbidities are present in very high amount uh, of this patient and they are uh, significantly worsening the outcome of this patient uh, because to start with the complications, uh, cardiovascular and uh, heart failure are much uh, uh, higher in the patient with COVID. Therefore, uh, this is a uh, very important uh, part of the puzzle, which is now very much uh, investigated in a different uh, clinical science. If we look at the pathogenesis, we may say that they are so-called uh, main underlying mechanism, but also the contributing factors. Like with everything in medicine, the contribu contributing factors can be uh, very important. And those uh, refers on the first place on the comorbidities in this patient. Uh, obviously, acute kidney injury, stress-induced cardiomyopathy, previous myocarditis, and tachyarrhythmia is something which is uh, developing during the infection itself. However, if, if all this is uh, uh, coming on the already injured myocardium, uh, the effects and outcomes are much worse. Obviously, the major mechanism of COVID-19 effect on myocardium uh, healthy and disease is on the first place, uh, acute myocardial ischemia combined with uh, uh, micro or micro uh, infection, but also with inflammation in the forms of myocarditis. Obviously, uh, everybody is mentioned in cytokine storm, uh, which is uh, predominant in severe infection, causing the multi-organ dysfunction and also contributing to the acute myocardial injury. So, as it was already pointed out, uh, ESE put together the guidance document, which addresses uh, most of the uh, COVID uh, aspects of cardiovascular disease. Uh, the big part of this document was also dedicated uh, to the heart failure because we know that this uh, alliance may lead to the fast and uneven food recovery. Uh, let's look at uh, the diagnosis. And if we look at the diagnosis, it can be clearly seen that uh, starting uh, from the uh, uh, physical examination, as well as to the, uh, as well as uh, to the, uh, uh, clinical signs, uh, uh, fever can be seen in the most patient on admission. And, uh, and then uh, obviously what is happening, uh, uh, hypoventilation, then hypoxemia and dyspnea are very much uh, involved and very much present in all the, of this patient. Uh, this table presents the comparative uh, 
uh, symptoms and uh, the com compar comparative physical exams in heart failure and COVID-19 as and as may as you may have seen uh, some of them are overlapping but some of them uh, can be also distinguished especially in the patient who are coming for the first time in hospital as uh, the way how we can make the the differential diagnosis uh, pretty early uh, in addition comparative imaging is important obviously we start with uh, electrocardiogram chest x-ray and lung a CT and uh, all this uh, can can have uh, the importance in making the final diagnosis. Obviously, having in mind uh, the clinical cl the clinical sense, electrocardiogram can be useful. However, sometimes uh, the clinical presentation and features are overlapping. And uh, when we look at the chest X-ray, which is done in most of the institutions uh, routinely, the uh, changes in the patient with heart failure and congestions are preferentially distributing to lung uh, basis. However, if we look at the, at the COVID-19, uh, we have uh, uh, peripheral diffuse ground glass opacities, which are quite different uh, in comparison with heart failure. In, in addition, the size of the heart in, in COVID is normal and uh, with, with the patient uh, with heart failure is presenting uh, mostly with uh, cardiomegalia. Obviously, uh, we use uh, uh, lab tests, uh, which are showing the, the signs uh, of infection, but also the signs of the organ damage uh, Natriuretic peptides uh, can be useful, however, they can be increased in, in both instances. Then the troponin is also useful, but not at a higher extent. Uh, although CK and LDH are uh, in COVID uh, significantly rise and usually normal in uh, heart failure. That is also true for the dead dimmer. Uh, which is uh, normal in heart failure, but not in COVID uh, if the thrombosis uh, develops. Uh, therefore, it is extremely important uh, in the triage department to develop the cr cr cross-diagnostic flow chart, how we are going to approach uh, to this patient, because as it was already said, the symptoms may be confused, and admission to specific uh, COVID units uh, may be especially identified by, by knowing well the clinical and laboratory screening results. Uh, sometimes the pulmonary uh, findings are, are important, but pneumonia and pulmonary edema sometimes may uh, co coexist, which may uh, cause uh, the confusion. So if we look uh, at the patient with heart failure who comes uh, to the hospital and suspected to COVID, it's, uh, it's algorithm uh, shown here. It's obviously that uh, the screening for COVID can be done. If the patient is suspicion or negative and but high clinical probability, he should be admitted to isolated area and uh, uh, be uh, and uh, have the repeated COVID test. If the patient is uh, uh, clearly COVID, then uh, the, the, he should be transferred to the COVID uh, department and and uh, start the continued uh, treatment for the uh, COVID, but also start the treatment for the COVID and continue treatment for uh, heart failure. So uh, sometimes uh, there is a doubt, uh, is the patient uh, having uh, acute coronary syndrome or unstable angina? Because concomitant coronary artery disease and myocarditis sometimes can be overlapped and have the significant uh, symptoms uh, as well as EKG finding. So what is important uh, to understand that uh, in suspected coronary artery disease and geography uh, should be performed according to the guidelines. 
then in suspected myocarditis, uh, and geography is recommended, but to rule out acute coronary syndrome. Uh, we find CMR method of choice for diagnosing of acute myocarditis. Uh, if the patient is uh, able to, uh, to have uh, this type of diagnosis. And the myocardial biopsy also should be considered, but uh, not routinely and only in the cases with severe refractory heart failure. Uh, acute heart failure uh, may sometimes be the presentation during the COVID infection in approximately one-fourth of the all hospitalized patient. Uh, however, nothing is uh, specifically can be said, except that the same treatment strategy can be applied to the patient with and without COVID. And if the patient with COVID develop acute heart failure, uh, the prognosis is amid and uh, uh, the uh, a short uh, clinical outcome may be foreseen. Uh, so uh, it is very important that uh, that uh, that we developed a kind of uh, severity assessment on this patient. So uh, we may uh, put them uh, as uh, as a different uh, as a different uh, kind of uh, uh, approach. If we put them as severely inpatient and critically inpatient. Uh, we may say that in the first group, severely ill patients with heart failure are those with tachypnea, with uh, respiratory rate and more than 30 breaths in minute, with uh, uh, oxy oxygen saturation lower than 93, uh, are low arterial partial pressure, and pulmonary imaging showing more than 50% progression of lesion within 40, 24 to 48 hours. However, critically one are those who have respiratory failure in need of mechanical invitation, uh, in ventilation and shock and other organ failures. Obviously, a both group of the patient require rapid care and, and admission to intensive care unit. Uh, there are some prediction of uh, predictors of uh, outcome, and some of them are uh, very easy to clinically recognize. If the patient with heart failure and COVID-19 come to the concomitant uh, arrhythmia to start with, he does not have the good outcome. On the lung uh, CT, uh, COVID-19 related specific changes can be seen if the extend extension of these changes is high, then the patient may have uh, a significant problem in, in, in further uh, uh, clinical course. The elevated troponin levels and the markers of, of inflammation of thrombotic risk are also one who are, uh, who are signing uh, the bad clinical outcome and, and uh, uh, shorter uh, approach to, the, to this patient needs to be done in terms of uh, intensive treatment. There is so-called sequential organ failure assessment, uh, which is giving us uh, the straightforward uh, idea uh, to find uh, what patient will have the poor prognosis, but also the increase in multi-organ damage uh, like serum troponin, which, uh, which is a marker of cardiac, uh, then transaminase, which is a marker of liver damage, and then create um, myoglobin and creatinine in skeletal muscle injury and the renal impairment. Or that means that in taking care of this patient, we need to be very careful in prevention and uh, in applying the general rules, not only for patient, but also for healthcare professionals and rule for the hospital visit. These rules are very much known, but as it was already said, they are not easy to apply. Uh, the persistence and the responsibility uh, in uh, uh, considering properly the rule for healthcare professionals, patient and hospital visit is uh, needed all time. Uh, obviously, uh, many of the hospitals as, as uh, we did in Serbia are making the triage points of ambulatory patient in whom the patient and caregiver are uh, properly 
protected. Uh, if the patient is COVID-9 uh, suspected, uh, he has a dedicated ambulatory setting uh, uh, where, where he can uh, uh, be further uh, clarified. If the patient has non-suspect COVID-9 setting, then he is treating uh, in a separatory ambulatory setting and may proceed with the further cardiovascular diagnosis. Uh, all these treatment options, which I'm going to describe in a minute, uh, are going uh, uh, to be applied during the home treatment in stable clinical condition, in school hospitalization for symptomatic patient with heart failure, and obviously in the ICUs of the patient with the end of the life treatment. We were happy to put together clinical practice update as, as uh, the guidelines between uh, official guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology, and they are applying uh, of the treatment of uh, this patient. So uh, medication uh, should be initiated and continued uh, per uh, the clinical picture, as well as the etiology of this patient. What is especially important is assessment of the fluid status, uh, which is not easy to address in the compensated heart failure if the patient is stable. And besides COVID treatment, he, ha he may have oxygen support, non-invasive and uh, invasive uh, ventilation is needed. One of the major problem in those patients is to, to restore and maintain uh, uvolemia because fluid status and uh, the threat of hypertension is uh, always present. So we need to apply the heart failure medication in that terms that we try to, to keep the patient in the best range of heart rate and uh, blood pressure. Obviously, diuretics should be carefully adjusted uh, because, I, as I already pointed out, dehydration and hypovolemia are the constant threat. Uh, therefore, uh, sometimes it may be uh, necessary to adjust the AC inhibitors, uh, ARBs, and uh, especially diuretics uh, dosage. Uh, the story with uh, AC inhibitors and uh, ARBs was already mentioned. Uh, to conclude, AC inhibitors and ARBs should be continued uh, because they are, they are main stem therapy which prolongs life and diminishes the symptoms. Sometimes the dosage can be considered as something which needs uh, to be modified. A heart rate drug, uh, beta blockers on the first side, uh, are necessary. They are protecting heart failure patient uh, from the worsening of heart failure, and uh, they should be continued. However, if from some reason beta blocker cannot be continued or aptitrated to the to the best dosage, ivabradine, ivabradine can be used or alone or in uh, uh, those with uh, low uh, low dose uh, beta blockers. Uh, patient with left ventricular assist device and heart transplantation are uh, uh, very sensitive ones because they have a greater susceptibility to the infection and strict preventive measures uh, are needed. In the patient uh, with LVAD, also they are a high risk of uh, anticoagulants disturbances. And in the patient with heart transplantation, the, the very important risk is also constant infection and uh, one needs to take care of that uh, very carefully. Supporting management is uh, very well known. Both oxygenation and renal replacement therapy uh, should be also applied. The, the general condition of the patient, uh, the blood pressure, heart rate, and uh, respiration rate uh, should be taken into account applying the measures which are generally applied in COVID-19 patients. However, sometimes uh, heart failure patients are developing uh, serious complications like severe arrhythmia. In some instances, the electric car invasion is recommended and then thromboembolism and bleeding is a constant problem and uh, uh, physicians in emergency units 
need to uh, have uh, particular attention on it because this is something which may cause uh, the catastrophic and uh, very, very fast end of the patients. Uh, I'm not going to address the comorbidities because these comorbidities are also uh, the etiology of heart failure and these are all uh, a kind of uh, worsening, not only heart failure, but also uh, the comorbid uh, state during the COVID-19. The drug, drug interactions are very important. Uh, all of the drugs which are used uh, uh, during the uh, treatment of COVID-19 may have some interaction as seen in uh, this table. This in interaction needs to be taken into account, uh, taking on the first place in mind that uh, the basic treatment for heart failure should be continued uh, because uh, if these drugs uh, will be halted, uh, the imminent uh, clinical worsening uh, can be seen. Uh, uh, dear uh, colleagues, dear friend, just to conclude uh, and say that uh, association with uh, heart failure and COVID is uh, very often. It results from the uh, inflammation of the myocardium, but also from systematic inflammation and microvascular dysfunction. Patients with uh, heart failure are increased risk, and uh, it is best to hospitalize or heart failure patient for the COVID when they come, when they come in the, during the outbreak or the COVID era. At admission, the, the basic clinical assessment should be seen, having in mind that the clinical signs of heart failure and fluid status is mandatory. We do not recommend to change guideline directed heart failure med medical therapy, but also have in mind that uh, COVID-19 related therapy therapies may influence the basic heart failure therapy. Therefore, uh, we think that besides everything which was mentioned, telemonitoring is one of the best thing to address this patient whenever possible. I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Peter Safrovich, for an excellent uh, overview of heart failure and COVID-19 and uh, how COVID-19 actually can result in heart failure and, and how heart failure patients are more vulnerable to, uh, to COVID-19. And then what are the therapies that are available to us? So this brings us uh, to the end of the first two presentations, which have been really very excellent. Uh, Professor Achenbach very uh, elaborately showed us the substantial heterogeneity that we have in uh, Europe, and it is also present everywhere else, and that social distancing and lockdown actually is very effective. And there is a protection. Uh, what is important from everybody's point of view is that the healthcare workers must be protected, and there should be actually a substantial concern for those patients who are non-COVID and are not uh, actually reporting to the hospitals. Either people are not getting SES, as Professor Nathanbar alluded to, or they are actually uh, delaying the uh, consultation with their healthcare providers. Now, the th uh, I would now request Professor Han to, for his presentation and give us an overview of the Chinese experience that he that they have seen because they have actually very successfully overcome the uh, COVID-19 in their part of the world. Professor Han. We have uh, an interpreter for Dr. Han. Uh, we are uh, contacting with him. Just give us a okay. minute and we'll get this Thank done. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, today I'll talk about uh, middle effects and the mechanism of the marsh in Sukantan is the uh, compound change medicine and learn microsaccharides uh, uh, disturbance. Uh, firstly, I would like to introduce the strategies and the result of the uh, tackling 
of uh, COVID-19 uh, in China. The major strategies uh, in China, including the uh, quarantine uh, lockdown of city and uh, supportive uh, therapy and uh, traditional Chinese medicine therapy. In the present, some countries are learning from China and adopt to strategies uh, such as the uh, quarantine uh, lockdown of city or uh, supportive uh, therapy. However, in China, uh, more than uh, uh, 30% uh, COVID-19 case used traditional Chinese medicine. And the, uh, the maybe 19% uh, of them so in poor uh, condition. Um, for Trinitary, and this uh, experiment is neglected by some countries. Uh, by May 7, uh, 2020, the number of the total uh, COVID-19 case is 84,440. And the number of the uh, exiting COVID case is uh, 466. And uh, 79,305 cases are cute. And uh, 4,000 uh, 646 case day. This is the result of the uh, tackling uh, COVID-19 in China. This table, so the traditional Chinese medicine formula used in uh, COVID-19, which are recommended by Chinese government, we can find that the two Chinese formula used in pre-chronic stage. In the one, two, three, four, four formula used the male, moderate, the severe uh, core patients. In the early stage uh, of the uh, critical condition, uh, used the one uh, Chinese medicine formula, but totally, and this is read bar uh, indicate the formula uh, and the containing machine scanta. This is the popular uh, Chinese medicine. The machine scanta consists of ma huang, xing yer, si gao, and the gan chao. It's a very popular uh, formula in China uh, about uh, 2000 years ago. COVID-19 patients is uh, severe and critical stage, all have uh, C-space and uh, AD, ARDS and uh, acute uh, periatory distress syndrome, which are lack of, lock, uh, lack of uh, effects and uh, therapy. In normal condition, the distance between the microvessel and the uh, uh, VLA is very short. However, in the uh, cure 19, lot of the leukocytes adhere to the uh, pulmonary microvessel uh, and the immigration out of microvessel. Arbumin in the work leakage out of the uh, microvessel, which induced the uh, edema to their microvessel. And therefore, uh, our group uh, studied the uh, machine scan uh, treatment with the ARDS. Uh, the SD rice uh, was used this study. The rice lung injury model was established by LPS injection. Uh, Machine scan tongue over 13 uh, treatment by uh, injection after uh, six hours after LPS injection. 
the lung injury was assessed by six hour, 12 hour after LPS injection, respectively. The survival ratio was assessed over 72 hours after LPS injection. LPS reduced the survival ratio to the 43% and the uh, 72 hours after LPS injection, where post treatment with machine scan tongue and uh, 2.61 gram per kilogram, this is dose, markedly increased the survival ratio to the 83%. LPS decreased the mean blood pressure and increased body temperature and the heart ratio. And the, uh, post treatment with machine scan down from the uh, six hour after LPS injection and the 12 hour markedly uh, reduced the uh, membrane uh, pressure and the uh, uh, ameliorating the uh, temperature and the heart risk. In addition, HPS challenge for six hour and the 12 hour increased the carbon dioxide tense this is the six hour, uh, go to the 12 hour. The carbon dioxide tense was increased. However, post treatment with the machine scan time from six hour, markedly inhibits the, this increase. Uh, this uh, figure, so the oxygen uh, saturation, we can see here, after six hour and 12 hour after LPS injection, the oxygen saturation was markedly decreased. However, post treatment with machine scan down from this time in the 12 hour, the oxygen saturation was increased, recover. And the uh, oxygen uh, uh, parcel of pressure, uh, similar decrease after the uh, LPS uh, injection, six hour and the 12 hour post treatment with machine scan time inhibits this decrease. Looks like adhering to the winner of war, it's an early stage of tissue infiltration and the edema. This is no good treatment, no drug for the chronic. We use the style of uh, observes the microsaturation dynamic change. Can observe the leukocytes adhering to the vinular world. This is a normal condition. Now, leukocytes adhere to the vinular wall in the lung. However, LPS injection six up, number of leukocytes increase adhering to lung microvessel and still to the 12 hour. Post treatment with machine scan down from six hour, markedly inhibit a meteorite clear uh, leukocyte adhering to within the world. Which mechanism is to inhibit the expression of ICAM-1. The ICAM-1 over expression from six hour to 12 hour. However, post treatment with machine scan time from this time, at the 12 hour, the expression markedly inhibits the ICAM-1 expression uh, was decreased. In sepsis, a larger number of leukocytes stick adhering to microvessel. This is leukocyte. 
<clears throat> then I'm, go to uh, the whole side. I, Professor Han, can I just okay. uh, interrupt for a minute? Mm. Uh, okay. Actually, Thank the time our time for or time for the Zoom is uh, running out. So, is it possible that you can go to the last couple of slides and? because we understand that it is the microcirculation that you are referring to and the benefit of uh, uh, concentrating on the microcirculation when we are treating the patients with COVID-19. Okay. Okay. This is a uh, lung microcirculation. This is capillary, this is venial. This is lung microcirculation. This is lung uh, microvessel. And the post-treatment with the machine scan done, Mark Ely inhibits this change. Therefore, the traditional Chinese medicine can reduce the normally oxygen transport in the olive. Uh, in addition, machine scan down treatment also ameliorating the LPS induced inflammation in blood and the buffer and the lung tissue. Taluding five is one of the tight junctions that maintain microvascular barrier in targeting and play important role of the lung in this tissue edema. And uh, it, this is a normal condition. After uh, three hours HPS uh, uh, injection, this protein was done in the uh, 12 hours down. However, post the treatment with the machine scan down, recover this expression. The also machine scan down treatment inhibits the high expression of the toric flow and the uh, uh, phosphorylation circuit and the activity uh, in the kappa B uh, translocation to nuclear in LPS induced lung tissue. Therefore, we can summarize the uh, uh, machine scan down, uh, the amelioration effects and the mechanism and LPS induced lung microsexual disturbance, uh, microvascular hyperbability, and the organ injury. The machine scan down treatment can break the LPS uh, induced uh, trilateral overexpression, inhibits uh, CERC phosphorylation, inhibits uh, uh, intracarbonate translocation, therefore, inhibits the uh, infiltration, inflammatory cytokine production, inhibits uh, uh, the leukocyte and the intercellular in uh, item one adhesion to protein uh, expression. Therefore, Treatment with the Chinese medicine machine scan down can block the leukocyte adhesion and the lung injury. On the other hand, uh, broken the circ uh, phosphorylation can block the carbonyl system and the uh, uh, tight junction. Therefore, uh, the Chinese medicine can inhibit the lung uh, edema. Here, I want to just introduce the qi, uh, important elements of the Chinese medicine theory. The qi consists in air and the rice. The oxygen and the nutrition will produce ATP through the ATP synthesizer in the mitochondria. The ATP produced in vascular endothelium will promote the assemble to actin monuments into the filaments. T, modulating endothelium junction in the microvascular hyperbability by regulating the action and tight junction protein. T, maintain the action integrity in myocardial structure and the driver myocardial contraction that promotes blood flow. In the coronating, decrease in blood oxygen uh, fuzzle or pressure will lead to reduce the ATP, increase the microvascular hyperbability in and myocardial injury. Therefore, I'd like to just, add, uh, just like to the, introduce the, uh, some Chinese medicine. 
In Chinese name, it's cardiotonic pills. In Pakistan, called uh, tricardi, which consists in severely medical reheat, panic the ginseng, and the bruna. The dehydroxine phenolacate, DLA, is a major integration of the severely medical reheat. The uh, nodal ginseng RB1, R1 is one of the integration of the pancreas of the ginseng. Our group used the right cardiac ischemia reperfusion model demonstration that the tricardin improve right cardiac capillary in the cerium junction. This is a normal condition. Compared with the same group, after ischemia reperfusion in 90 minutes, the interstitial cell of the coronary vessel was swollen. Here, we can see the lots of the coward number increased. We, this increase induced the albumin leakage out of the microvessel, out of the microvessel, induced the uh, cardiac microvessel edema. However, post treatment with uh, Tycardi in the lower dose, the middle dose, high dose, markedly inhibits the uh, albumin leakage and the capillary endothelial injury. The Kenya electron microscopy also demonstrates that ischemia reperfusion induced the uh, coronary capillary injury compared with the similar group. However, treatment with the uh, tricardin to inhibit the coronary capillary incident after ischemia reperfusion. This slide saw the myocardial perfusion result they take detect the laser trupla compared with the similar group in the baseline after ischemia reperfusion in 30 minutes and the ischemia reperfusion induced the perfusion decrease. However, treatment with the CP, uh, also uh, the name is uh, Taikadin in Pakistan, and the dose dependence manner inhibited this decrease, particularly high dose very effects. This slide showed electron microscopy image. So the Taikadin prevents the injury compared with the same group. This myocardial uh, ultrastructure, such as the disruption myocardial field in the swelling mitochondria, treatment with uh, Taikadin, low dose, middle dose, high dose, those dependence might inhibit this change. The lava panel saw the TDC staining compared the same group treatment with the uh, Taikadin, lava dose, high dose, particularly high dose inhibits the TTC uh, staining area increase, indicates the Taikadin can prevent ischemia reperfusion induced infraction. In the other hand, after ischemia reperfusion and the uh, three hours, uh, can I, can I interrupt, can I interrupt okay. Professor Han for a second? Professor okay. Han, can you hear okay. me? Uh, uh, can I just uh, request you that since we are running out of time and we will, we want to have a little bit more discussion on the, okay. your experience and okay. the experience of the others and the panelists okay. here. So we can yeah, then- This is last, uh, last PPT, last okay. PPT. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, post treatment with uh, CP can prevent uh, ischemia reperfusion induced uh, cardiac injury and uh, development to the cardiac fibrosis. This is post treatment with this Chinese medicine prevents this uh, increased luster. The beneficent uh, role of the uh, cardiotonic pillars 
it's been a combinate effects of the DLA and the R1. The DLA binding to CERT1 after regulating the NDF10 and the subunit of the components one in mitochondria, which can promote electron trans in mitochondria, inhibits the superoxide ion production. However, on the other hand, R1 can upregulate in the ATP5 day in the subunit of the wow. ATP side, promoting ATP. Therefore, uh, this company uh, may be the mechanism of the, the, comp, uh, the, Chinese, the Chinese medicine, the combination uh, the role. Okay, uh, however, I do not know that this uh, Chinese medicine could be used for the treatment of the lung uh, microsaccharide disturbance uh, in Corona. Uh, Having the have data uh, which need a future study. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Han. I'm sorry that I had to interrupt because of the shortage of time. <clears throat> now we have uh, time for discussion from uh, with all the speakers and the panelists. In the beginning, I just uh, missed out introducing my very dear friend, Professor Bashir Hanif who is the past president of the Pakistan Interventional Society, a very accomplished cardiologist. And uh, now I would request first from Dr. Bashir Hanif, if he has any questions or uh, any experiences which he has regards COVID-19. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shabazz. Actually, um, I, I've been traveling for the last uh, three days, just came back from US after stuck there for two months. So that's why I'm kind of not really live on there because I'm sitting in a small quarantine hotel <laughs> in, in Karachi. So anyway. Um, that, is, that is actually what uh, COVID-19 is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so no, thank you very much. Uh, all the um, uh, talks were excellent. Um, I think it uh, gave a great overview of uh, the problem going on and how to handle this. Um, we are definitely seeing a um, uh, lot of this problem in uh, Pakistan as well. And uh, I think all the topics were pertinent and related to us as well. Um, no, the major problem, I think, um, as my other Pakistani colleagues will share that also is that our um, uh, basically health healthcare workers are really affect being affected the most. And um, I think despite uh, taking, I, 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 there was a lack of PPEs and uh, despite taking the precautions, I think things are really kind of um, getting uh, proportionally, the healthcare workers are being affected more in Pakistan as compared to probably other countries. So we really need to take a lot of precautions to do that. Now, my questions regarding uh, these talks, I think one of the major things regarding uh, uh, the heart failure talk, um, we see a lot of patients who come in with shortness of breath and um, sometimes it becomes difficult to really differentiate whether it is a heart failure or you would be concerned about um, uh, COVID. So my question is that, uh, I think you did mention also briefly in your talk that all patients coming in with shortness of breath should be assumed as COVID uh, patients uh, unless proven otherwise after the testing? Uh, there, Professor Peter? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you mentioned one of the major problems we have. Although we know what is a violin and what is a stick, but you need to play. So it's yeah. sometimes it's not easy. And uh, some of our uh, uh, tests can help. Uh, uh, I also underline some of the uh, effects on the on the different symptoms and uh, uh, finding uh, which you can uh, do only by the stethoscope. However, if we look at the test, uh, laboratory, laboratory, laboratory tests, they can help as well. So if the BMP is high, then probably this patient has heart failure. But don't forget that uh, heart failure may, may also go with uh, COVID. So uh, to make the long story short, it is important for us to look at, at the holicity of the patient, see whom, 
who we have in front of us, uh, assess the clinical status, but also take an appropriate epidemiological, uh, anam- I mean, uh, 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 qu- query, because if this patient was at home and did not uh, move too much and had already heart failure before, so it's not very likely that this patient had COVID. However, is if this patient was traveling somewhere where the COVID is uh, is uh, ongoing, the the epidemic is ongoing, and he has a borderline heart failure and then present with the uh, with the symptoms, then we need to be very careful. So there is no unifying uh, reply of what you are saying, but more the complexity of the things uh, we can do, and also what is extremely important is a good triage because you underline one of the major problems, uh, and this is the infection of the, of the health professionals. And uh, I'm sorry to say, and maybe all of you has the same experience. Uh, I had the, the, the very sad experience that two of our colleagues in the University Medical Center uh, in Belgrade died because of the COVID. Uh, they were strong, they were uh, still uh, very young, and uh, they underestimated the the complexity and the danger of the disease. Uh, so I think. Uh, what? Just a minute. I will just a minute. Uh, Professor Peter, what you have underlined is a very important uh, aspect that we, as healthcare professionals, underestimate the seriousness of the disease and take it for granted that nothing will happen to us or that COVID only happens to others. Professor Stefan Achenbach, uh, do you have anything to add to this? Well, no. Um, I think you pointed out in your summary very elegantly that protecting the healthcare professionals is important just to protect them, but also to avoid hospitals <coughs> healthcare institutions to become spreaders of the disease into the community. So that's point number one. And it's not as easy as simply giving them personal protective equipment, because those who are not used to working with personal protective equipment, they have to learn how to safely use it. And even putting on and putting off glasses, face masks, gloves, is something that we in the cardiovascular world are not used to and you really have to pay attention to do it correctly. The other issue is that we are worried about the patients who are not coming to the hospital because they are afraid of catching COVID-19. And this is something likely that needs to be addressed on a national and also on a local level to make sure that the patients know that they can use the healthcare system safely. So I think that is a second very, very important aspect. Is there is there a kind of a social stigma in Europe on on patients who develop COVID nineteen? Because in Pakistan, this is what we are seeing. No, not at all. There is no social stigma here in Europe. To the contrary, some there is some sentiment that if you have COVID nineteen behind you, you are you know protected against catching the disease and spreading the disease again. So the antibody tests that will tell us whether somebody has COVID-19 infection behind him or behind her, uh, people are very much looking forward to. Okay, thank you very much. What what, only one more thing, they say the COVID-19 is affecting the older person, the older persons with a lot of comorbidities. That's only partially true. So everybody should use the protective equipment and everybody sh- should use the social distancing. Uh, uh, I am referring, I am referring in the most cases to the to the health professionals, but also to to everybody else because we were witnessing the very uh, similar and very uh, fastly moving uh, downhill cases of the person of the age forty to forty five. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we yeah, have Dr. Abed Amin. Okay, well, I just want to have Abed Amin. Dr. Abed Amin is the uh, chairperson for the uh, heart failure. Yes, uh, Abed. Yeah, let me tell you uh, 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 shortly the scenario in Pakistan 
up till last night uh, we had uh, our population tested were 270000 and the positive cases were around 27000 and the the death rate among the positive case cases were around 500 now my question is from the uh, from both the speakers is that uh, the mortality and morbidity in our patient were mostly those COVID positive patients who had uh, comorbidities mostly. And uh, very few young patients had the mortality or the disease was uh, severe without comorbidity. The question is, what is the experience in Europe about this hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and in how many patients they have use it and the mortality comparing with the placebo was uh, uh, different with, uh, those, with those. And uh, one of the professor from Nottingham, they said their experience with hydroxychloroquine is that the mortality was much higher in those patients where this hydroxychloroquine was used as compared to the placebo. So what is the experience in France, Germany, and in Serbia? Well, in Germany, I can say the following to the first part or to one part of your question about hydroxychloroquine. We use it in those patients whose oxygen saturation is low. That's for us in Germany, the threshold to use it in all intubated patients and in those who are not intubated yet, but whose oxygen saturation is going down. We are well aware that there is no data to confirm that this is really useful. There has been some data that high dose has been um, has been worse than low dose and an increased mortality with high dose hydroxychloroquine, but no randomized trial that I know of that has convincingly shown that it's useful. So this is why we have to make our patients aware that we are using this without any data to rely on. So it's being used, but we don't know whether it's useful. The other question is the question of comorbidities. There are voices even some pathologists and healthcare professionals who say that COVID-19 doesn't kill, patients don't die from COVID-19, they die with COVID-19 and all the patients have comorbidities and therefore COVID-19 is not dangerous. That's simply not true. If you do pathology exams on patients who died from COVID-19, you find comorbidity in many instances, but you would also find comorbidity in patients who die from other diseases it is simply the case that if somebody dies with 60, 65, or 70 years of age, you will find hypertension, you might find diabetes, you might find you know, some sort of minor um, disease here and there. It is simply not true. We have seen cases with who are completely healthy, such as Peter Seferic, which has pointed out healthcare professionals and not healthcare professionals, patients who have been completely healthy and who have been dying from disease. We have lost patients after pregnancy, young uh, women um, to COVID-19 with no comorbidities. We have lost healthcare workers. We have lost uh, 45 and 60 year old patients um, coming for example from Italy. So it is simply not true that it's only those who have comorbidities, unfortunately, who die from the disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Stefan. Uh, I'll bring in uh, Professor Ananda uh, and request him to give his experience uh, about the use of uh, HCQ and chloroquine and also the question with, uh, which Professor Abed Damin posed uh, just a while ago. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we uh, we having a sort of a unique situation because our case numbers are still quite low. Uh, we have a population of uh, 22 million uh, and at present uh, we got our first local case reported on uh, 10th of March and uh, since then up to yesterday night we had 850 patients uh, confirmed and uh, this is uh, in spite of having uh, doing a lot of very active contract tracing and testing. Uh, so we, we believe this uh, figure is quite close to the actual figure. Uh, and uh, in, uh, in our country, the, we made a decision uh, about a month ago or rather three weeks ago to give hydroxychloroquine to all positive symptomatic patients 
again, this shows, uh, as uh, uh, Stefan said, uh, this decision was not based on adequate amount of evidence. There was very, very little evidence supporting that, but uh, still we made that decision. And uh, we are continuing with that. Uh, in fact, we are analyzing whether there has been any benefit depending on the day of starting chloroquine. Uh, we are yet to uh, finish our analysis. Uh, the number of deaths we had were nine altogether. Out of these nine, uh, three patients were admitted in a critical state to hospitals. Uh, other six patients were admitted to hospital and then they, they gradually got worse. Uh, so they were in, in the hospital for some time. And uh, then in addition, there is another about 10 patients who needed uh, HDUKR and ICUKR. They were not ventilated, but they need the very high concentration of oxygen and they recovered. Uh, so most of our patients at present are mildly symptomatic patients. Uh, so uh, we don't know whether it is due to low case numbers or whether it is the situation in our country. We are yet to see. Um, so we, at present, we are, we are in the process of reviewing the decision of using HCQ, but uh, still we continue to use HCQ for all, all symptomatic patients. Well, what I would like, uh, Dr. Shabazz, something, like... some, something wrong with the sound from Dr. Ananda. Is it... uh, thank you, Dr. Ananda. May I just request uh, the organizers to unmute Dr. Parashar, please? Can you hear me? Can yes, hear you. now, yes. Dr. Parashar? Well, yeah, can you hear me now? Very well. I think because of a very sketchy scientific evidence and lack of a good trial, there can never be a unanimity about the treatment and prevention of most of these cases or so. Every country, every center has got their own, own sort of a guidelines or so. I will tell you our in our Indian scenario, what is happening is that from a prophylaxis point of view, the Indian Council of Medical Research and the government, besides other preventive measures, they have advised, rather than it is not a compelling thing, they have advised that besides all other features, take hydroxychloroquine, 400 milligrams. Countries and many others may not agree with, but that is our policy to give them all those who are treating COVID patients or associated with a COVID hospital. So they are giving hydroxychloroquine. And an interesting study is being done that all those patients, all healthcare workers who develop is called COVID positive, how many of them we are taking hydroxychloroquine and how we are not taking this, I think this will come out shortly when this study is done. So this is our policy or so. The same applies to those patients who are a sort of a, a those who have traveled abroad or those who are asymptomatic carriers or so. Now, one word about management. Now, we get two types of patients. One is having a flu-like illness. Now, they, whether it is a COVID case or not, so whenever a patient comes with a, with a sort of flu-like symptoms, till his report is available, we give them hydroxychloroquine in a small dose. Because higher dose have got a higher mortality. So we give them a small dose. And if the COVID test turns out to be negative, we stop the treatment. If it is positive, then we may continue for about five to six days, keeping all the all the things in mind. In prophylaxis, remember, we do not give to persons below 15 years of age and those above 60 years of age, unless it is really indicated because we, we don't advise them to go out or so. If we have to give them, then we do a full evaluation, especially kidney function, death, electrolyte imbalances or so. And those, of course, who have got more serious disease or so, when you have nothing in hand, it is an incurable disease, you try everything. So when there are more, uh, or more severe patients, then in those cases, we give them hydroxychloroquine and a short dose of a erythromycin. So this is our principle, both in prophylaxis and for management, we don't avoid. And that is why universally there is a shortage of hydroxychloroquine 
because persons are giving it also and my last uh, sentence to all the healthcare workers and doctors will be that please be aware of idiot syndrome i d i o t idiot syndrome means internet derived or information and causing wrong treatment also so this is our policy regarding this prophylaxis and management now it may not be having any scientific basis but that is what is the advisory of our indian council of medical research also thank you very much parashar it is what is known as the chicken uh, the kitchen sink policy where yeah. you throw everything in to just uh, see whatever can work in these patients uh, professor peter do you have any opinion regards chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine i have nothing to add uh, what stefan already pointed out so if the patient is going down we are we are using uh, chloroquine we are also using azathioprine as a antibiotic but there are no clear cut uh, uh, recommendation or comp or uh, uh, clinical trials who can tell us uh, where to go however what uh, will be extremely important is to know that there are the efforts in uh, three countries in in europe uh, which are suffering from the heavy uh, covid-19 load to to conduct the trials uh, which will be uh, very soon very soon in a few months uh, finished because the short term uh, uh outcome is something which uh, they are looking for so they we will we will know more however uh, before before i i finish uh, i would like just to extend the word of caution so in the last 3 uh, weeks uh, harfelier association had uh, two conferences uh, two vtcs exchanging the experiences among uh, 40 european uh, experts regarding covid and what ca uh, came out is that the um, incidence of pulmonary emboli in a young patient is extremely high so what we need to understand this covid-19 and it was already pointed out is much more than the lung infection this this virus is causing endothelitis endothelitis and probably vasculitis all over the body affecting most organs and probably and that needs to be true but there are some uh, uh published uh, there are some something published on the on the lancet uh, very recently that it's possible that the virus is concentrating on the lung affecting mostly the the pulmonary uh, endothelium uh, causing pulmonary thrombosis and subsequent pulmonary emboli which may be the explanation for some young patient without no comorbidities who die suddenly so now in the most of the of the units besides uh, uh, anticoagulation low weight heparin they use uh, the the sequencing the, of the pulmonary emboli echocardiogram in order to to avoid and exclude this complication so we as it was already pointed out we need to learn a little bit more but it's possible that we are concentrating on the lung and infection on the lung and the virus is affecting the whole vasculature thank you peter because i think uh, basically the virus enters the respiratory system through the respiratory system and is vasculotrophic it is causing uh, uh, generalized vasculitis as you have said uh, now may i just uh, have some views because uh, professor peter talked about pulmonary embolization is there a role of anticoagulation in these patients uh, can you can you unmute uh, dr nanet please if i may add the any role for aspirin also hello yes hello <coughs> yes uh Here in the Philippines, we've also been seeing cases like that, and uh, we've talked to some of the experts also in the intensive care unit, and a lot of them are using anticoagulation early. 
because of cases of vasculitis also for for these patients. Um, I'd like also to make mention that in terms of Philippine experience, it's basically just like in Pakistan, there's some social stigma in the Philippines associated with COVID infection. I think that's one of the reasons why we had very high infection rates among healthcare workers, especially in the earlier part of the of the illness because a lot of the patients were actually not disclosing history of travel and only for us to find out that they were infected um, and only for us to find out later on that our healthcare workers are also infected. But now one of the concerns is because it's already in the community transmission level in the Philippines. So right now everybody's considered COVID positive unless proven otherwise. Now, one of our concerns, of course, is in the hospitals, when patients come in for consultation or for patients who need surgery, they are considered to be COVID positive unless proven otherwise. And they need to be tested first before they can be declared to be COVID negative. And one of our concerns also is in terms of the health main, uh, the HMOs, um, because some of the HMOs would not want to cover expenses for COVID testing. But right now, it's being recommended that everybody needs to be tested for, for COVID. One of, uh, one of the things we've noticed is that it has already transcended all population levels because we've seen newborns becoming positive a few hours after being born. We've seen children, we've seen women who were operated, who were initially asymptomatic and then tested positive for COVID subsequently. So these are, these are quite concerns for us also. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nanette, for uh, a very good uh, views about uh, anticoagulation. May I request Professor Stefan to kindly elaborate on uh, the, the role of uh, low molecular weight heparin. I was looking at a recent paper which said that uh, when the, the, the coronavirus actually, if you want to prevent it from being attached to the AC2 receptor, you can give a low molecular weight heparin and that will cleave the proteins in it at a certain level which will prevent its entry. So that is that is one of the most recent publications because while I was trying to prepare for this uh, webinar, I thought I should also look into what is happening everywhere else. So uh, are you aware of that uh, paper? No, I'm not aware of this paper. Um, I have to say, and we do give low molecular weight heparin as thrombosis prophylaxis to all the patients who are hospitalized with infectious disease uh, anyways. Whether we should increase this to a higher dose is uncertain, and we're not doing it because, um, we, as you know, a full anticoagulation also has side effects that we want to avoid. And it's the same everywhere. There are no randomized trials for the treatment of hypertension or the, for, for the treatment of hyperlipidemia. We insist on using randomized trials, and we don't do anything that is not proven in randomized trials. So now here we're in a difficult situation where we have a disease that is grave, but the treatments that are suggested and that are flying around in the internet are potentially also grave. So we are stuck and we are trying to do what is reasonable and we cannot recommend, strongly recommend anything that is not proven in a clinical randomized trial based on laboratory data or initial observations in animals. We have to be very careful to recommend anything. Having said that, there's also- Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry, sorry, please go ahead. You were saying something. And, and said that there's also data that suggests that statins might be useful because it's an endothelium. The endothelium is the, is the target of the virus. Potentially, statins make our endothelium more healthy. So there's also theoretical rationale that statins would be useful. But all of this is out there in the, in the data-free zone, and we don't know whether we should do it or not. What do you, what do you think? about the statins if if somebody who's already taking it should con continue definitely if you need who's not taking it at all should he take should he take it to as a prevention we don't know i would <laughs> can he take a stat <laughs> okay uh, they, they can i ask a question from stefan uh, in this uh, professor peter to please uh, say something about the NOACs or the DOACs in as regards the anticoagulant uh, mode. 
in, in these patients with COVID-19. And also, you <laughs> mentioned the A's and the ARBs in heart failure. What is your take on the army? Should it be continued also? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So we, we were facing that at the beginning of the, of the COVID era. And uh, uh, there were even some uh, associations uh, which uh, gave the slight uh, recommendation to stop uh, uh, ACE inhibitors and ARPs. That will be the mistake. Don't stop them because they are the main stem of the treatment of heart failure therapy. Don't stop them, continue with them. And there is no absolute uh, proof that this affects the course of the COVID-19. Uh, on the on the other hand, uh, other, all other therapy, I try to underline that for heart failure, uh, you may uh, uh, modify it. Beta blockers are one who may be uh, who may be also uh, needed to, to the, the modification. And uh, we we never uh, mention sacubitril or sartan because the number of the cases on sacubitril and COVID is not uh, big. However, we should uh, also look at that because acubitril is known to be associated with hypotension and we need to be careful to preserve uh, the, the, the good uh, blood pressure and the good heart rate in this uh, acute infectious disease setting uh, to prevent the detrimental course of the, of the uh, clinical development. Uh, one of the things which you may uh, be interesting for the forum is that Mandeep Mera from uh, Harvard is pursuing the study, uh, trying to put all autopsies of, uh, of COVID patient in one place. So having the autopsy, uh, let's say 100 or 200 autopsies, will give us an excellent overview what is going on in uh, those patients and also will help us to adjust uh, the therapeutic strategies. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Peter, for your comments. Now, may I request Dr. 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 Harun? Uh, Har Harun, uh, <laughs> I, actually, I was just seeing your name there and I, I thought that maybe uh, you were busy somewhere. Harun, let me know. Uh, there's ah, a no, question. I'm there's a question being asked again and again that uh, what about the patients who are hypertensive per se? Are they more prone towards COVID-19 infection or uh, that COVID-19 infection can occur in those patients who have other comorbid conditions? Well, thanks. The, just briefly from the Kenyan perspective, with a population of about 50 million. We've been fortunate that the tsunami has not either arrived to Africa and over about 50,000 cases. Uh, Kenya only has about 600 cases or 700 cases we've seen. So our numbers are still very low and we have not seen uh, uh, the sad state of affairs that have been seen in other countries. Now the question here is regarding really the complex interplay between the virus and cardiovascular disease. I think there are many mechanisms that are going to yet to be elucidated, but one thing we do see, and this is coming from data from China, from Europe, and from the United States, is that COVID itself does affect uh, the, the general population, but in those who have pre-existing cardiovascular disease or uh, hypertension, diabetes, and its risk factors, they are at a higher mortality and have higher risk of complications. But having those comorbidities itself, maybe hasn't, we don't have evidence that shows that it is directly makes you predisposed to the infection. If one gets the infection, then that complex interplay may predispose one to developing higher complications of cardiovascular disease of uh, COVID infection, including uh, mortality, uh, respiratory failure, myocarditis, arrhythmias, etc. I think we shouldn't also forget that the patient who is hypertensive or with cardiovascular disease, there's a complex drug drug interaction. And in our attempts to use antivirals, chloroquine, in those who have uh, uh, other cardiovascular drugs, 
may then bring out this uh, complex drug drug interaction predisposed uh, you said that uh, in your part of the world there is a reduced incidence of uh, covid-19 is that right we have not seen big, big the large numbers yet you not seeing the large numbers do you think there is some in ingrained kind of an immunity there some people talk about bcg and uh, the other like people who taking anti malarials that they are the ones who probably have some kind of an immunity to it in in pakistan they were saying that but now we are having an uh, the incidences in pakistan yes no we are not we are not seeing that i mean our cases are still few but i think the high rate of uh, whether it's anti malarials or uh, background uh, other infections or even immunity such as hiv uh, is still not providing any explanation for our low numbers of protection south africa too has a higher hiv population but they're still seeing high numbers of covid 19 uh, infections compared to the rest are there any other questions or uh, comments that somebody would like to make can i put one comment and a question yes i think the she has a head because it, it, it is a very it is a very practical question yes are we to are we to over worried or over emphasizing the prolonged qtc interval because i why i say this many patients have an asymptomatic qtc interval prolongation in some patients yeah. in some studies up to 35% of the patient had a prolonged qt interval but they did not have any arrhythmia so if we avoid any other drug and maintain a good electrolytes balance and hydration are we still worried too much about prolonged qt interval or unless it is progressively increasing i think i think that uh, you are the answer the question because uh, Uh, the prolonged QT interval sometimes can be benign, but if it's not associated with arrhythmias, we may just monitor the patient. However, it is if the patient and also it's uh, important what type of patient is that. If, if there is a patient with coronary artery disease with lo lo lower ejection fraction or, or uh, already known heart failure, we should be more careful. Yes, sir, Shabas. Uh, I think just uh, a little. Hello, hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Just a comment with regard to the question earlier yes. regarding yes. BCG vaccination yes, that please. may provide protection. Uh, we don't see any association with that also because for Filipinos we are all vaccinated with BCG uh, because it's endemic in the Philippines. Yeah. Yet we saw um, a rapid rise also of cases uh, of COVID nineteen in the Philippines and. what seemed to start lowering down the cases were, was when we did the community quarantine program uh, right now community quarantine is still um, implemented in the philippines although uh, it's about to end in the in about a week's time we're not sure if once the quarantine has been lifted if there is going to be a new surge of uh, cases again That's a bit of a concern. I think one of our concerns also in the Philippines is because we do not have massive testing of patients because of the very big population. So right now, testing in the Philippines is based on the risk factors of the patient. Like if you are symptomatic, you are in the first tier. So right now, they are patients are divided into four categories as to who will be um, who will be prioritized in terms of testing. So. We're not re at this point in time. It's still a little bit hard for us to determine uh, with regard to the actual case incidence for the Philippines, because mass testing is only starting now. Uh, we're at the level that we're testing around 8,000 people a day, but they're hoping that by the end of May, would be able to test around 30,000 people per day, and we might get a more representative count in terms of the incidence of COVID-19 for the Philippines. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, I would request my European colleague 
to give us a little advice also and then you have a plateau or at least it is coming down <clears throat> and then you have talked about the easing out of the lockdown and in uh, for example in sweden they never had a lockdown in pakistan uh, our authorities probably feel that they they should ease the lockdown but we still haven't seen our peak <laughs> what would be your advice well if i may say um we have had an, a long period of lockdowns and have started easing the lockdown a week ago and most of my colleagues and i myself are very uncomfortable about it um it's like we, I mean, we all know the experts in this disease nobody is because it's here the first for the first time but if you compare it to what we do in cardiovascular medicine if you have a patient who has hypertension and you have the hypertension under control with medication you're not telling the patient to stop the medication because now the blood pressure is con under control and if you will stop the medication if you stop the treatment blood pressure will go back up and we are very worried that case numbers will rise again now that the um, social restrictions have been lifted they have not been lifted completely we still have a situation where large gatherings are not allowed um concerts and medical conferences and other conferences are forbidden and schools are not yet back in full operation also paid uh, individuals are requested to wear face masks in public but whether these measures are sufficient is uncertain and we are worried that they are not and nobody knows we will have to wait for another two weeks or so until we know but we are worried i would like to take the opportunity to thank professor shabas for this uh, webinar because i have to log off so thank you for uh, allowing us to exchange our thoughts and ideas across the world and also thank you from the european society of cardiology for helping um, to spread the news and the important data that we have and the important information and guidance together with the heart failure association with peter severovich to uh, um, other important parts of the world so thank you very much and all have a nice sunday thank you professor stefan achenberg it was an honor to have you with us and uh, to uh, listen to your european experience and also the management and i think it's very extremely important that the esc document on guidance should be read by all of us because that gives us some insight into what should be done and similarly i think uh, what dr uh, professor peter safrovich also talked about heart failure and uh, covid-19 it is like uh, they they are interconnected and uh, i think that also the overview which he gave also was excellent and uh, all the entire audience i am sure have gained a lot we have also gained from the panel of experts that uh, who participated in it and they gave their very valuable comments i'm sorry if uh, i was not able to uh, listen to all of them in detail as they would have wanted to but obviously there was a shortage in time and everybody had to be brought in i would like to thank you all very much from india from ceylon from philippines from kenya all over the countries who, who participated in it from pakistan dr abid amin uh, dr professor han from china thank you so much sir for your participation we are fully aware of the microcirculatory disorder that uh, we uh, think of it in the context of covid-19 and the usefulness of the chinese traditional chinese medicine because it is many many centuries old so i'm grateful to all my panelists to all my speakers and uh, in the end i will request uh, sayed umair farooq maruf who was the man behind the this digital presentation and uh, for him to give some concluding remarks over to you sayed umair maruf sir thanks for the input sir uh, i would like to pay thanks uh, uh, to professor shabaz first of all for connecting the dots of the different parts of world and on behalf of gets pharma which is a research driven branded generic pharmaceutical company i would like to pay thanks especially to professor sifin and professor peter uh, for giving the keynote talk just to add a few points to the session that uh, we are exclusively supporting to all initiatives of pakistan cardiac society heart failure council since the time it is formed through unrestricted educational grants and today's program is one of those besides this our digital team our digital team ensure to promote, promote this highly scientific program 
across all countries to make sure our message reached to masses in this lockdown situation of covid-19 the time where there is restriction on medical conferences and air travels but we are broadcast we have broadcasted this live program in 19 countries right now and around 1500 people were watching us live as of today it's this session was attended by as of our stats the session was attended by 10000 people across the world lastly i would like to close to this line that we'll keep on providing more tomorrow to our people through collaborative initiatives of get pharma heart failure council your pill society of cardiology and heart failure association in future thank you professor shahbaz thanks for your time sir all the best to all of you and let's thank get together soon sure sir take care thank Have you very nice much and night. all of you stay thank safe you. thank stay you thank you bashir thank you bashir thank you everybody thank you thank stay you very safe. much